I think as far as the announcements go, I think that is all I have, and I think we're going to sing something. Yes, we're going to be singing about the beautiful cross as we are thinking about this week what Jesus did for us on that cross to take our sins away. We're going to sing that beautiful song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And we want to thank Jonathan Hunsucker for being here this morning, playing for us, and he's going to be sharing a song with us a little bit later.
um, but she is doing good. And, uh, and then also we sent one out about Zach Cranford's dad, Jeff Cranford, and uh, had to be sent to the hospital, but everything is okay, everything's fine, he is, he is back home and, uh, and doing great. So I appreciate your prayers for him. And then also uh, remember Miss Shirley uh, during this time. Miss Shirley's not doing well, and uh, she is uh, now in intensive care uh, in, uh, in Stanley County in Albemarle and uh, not doing well at all. So you remember Miss Shirley, you remember their family. Uh, during this time as well. And um, let's do this. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and, uh, and ask the Lord to intervene on behalf of these and to ask His blessing upon uh, the rest of the music and, and the message today. All right, Father, we again want to just come to you and just praise your name for all the many blessings and all the good things that you, you've caused to, to send our way. And uh, Lord, I tell you, I, I want to thank you also for the bad things you send our way because even in those, there are lessons in those and things you want to teach us and things that we need to learn. And, uh, and Lord, I want to thank you for it. And uh, Lord, I, I pray for each and every prayer request that has been mentioned. I pray for each family uh, that's going through difficult situations, difficult times, doing going through trials. And Lord, I pray that our eye and our focus and our hearts would be fixed upon you uh, during these times. And Lord, I pray for those that have physical ailments. And Lord, I pray your healing touch upon them. And uh, Lord, I pray for those around us that have spiritual needs. And Lord, I pray that you. Um, you reach out to them and, and, and woo them and uh, and draw them to yourself. And Lord, I pray for each and every, every one of us that we would all be drawn closer to you as a result of what you're doing in the world around us. And uh, Lord, we want to thank you again for loving us, being so good to us. And Lord, we pray your blessings again, again today upon the music, upon the message. And uh, may you be honored and glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now John's got a special song for us. And I think this is a song that he wrote. All right, so uh, go ahead, John. Jesus cared for me that he died on Calvary. Spotless lamb was he sacrificed for me.
time for that song. And uh, we will sing one more at the end of the service today. So be prepared for that. And I want us to go in our Bibles this morning to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. This particular day that we're celebrating today, Palm Sunday, is, is a very important day as far as God's timetable goes. There's a whole lot. I'm going to give you a few things. But there's a whole lot in the Old Testament uh, that points to this very day, to, point to this very time. And uh, we're going to look at some of those and, and, and get an application from what for, for life today uh, through this. Uh, but this day is very important. Now remember, uh, this, this week, now remember, this coming Sunday is also Resurrection Sunday. So this is the week uh, that the Lord Jesus would bleed and die on the cross over 2,000 years ago. And, um, and this triumphal entry, this Palm Sunday, is the day that he came in into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And they were putting palms down and waving the palms for crying Hosanna. And we're going, to, we're going to read that. And then we're going to look at some things from the Old Testament and then make some application. All right? And, uh, and so and we're also, we've been studying Genesis 49, and then on Wednesday nights, well, Sunday nights and previously, and now on Wednesday nights, we've been studying in the book of Daniel. And we're going to take some of that from Genesis and some of that from Daniel and tie it together to how it fits into this particular passage today, all right? So, uh, so uh, you, you're going to have to keep up with me, all right? There's going to be some things you might even have to write down to go study later on because I can't give you all of the... All of the information that I'd like to give you um, for sake of time, but if you would just write these things down and you can go back and study them later. But in John chapter 12, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 12. Uh, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him. And they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Now, there's a few things here uh, that the disciples didn't even recognize what was going on but later, after the Lord was glorified, or after He had risen and, and ascended into heaven, they remember some of the Old Testament things that were written. And we're going to go back and look at some of those things. And then also at the same time, the Pharisees are mentioned here in the last verse. And, and, and they're, they're said, Behold, the world is gone after Him. Look, the, the Pharisees hated Jesus. They were angry about this. I mean, in their heart, they wanted to kill him. And as a matter of fact, in other places of Scripture, before this instance, that's what they had determined already to do, was to find a way to put Jesus to death. And so this was uh, determined by them to already do it. There was a hatred, there was an animosity there, and they desired to kill him. And again, this was not just the Pharisees. This was the majority of religious leaders that felt this way. And so the first thing we understand here that, that Jesus rides in on the donkey, People are praising him. They have palm palm trees and palm trees. Palm branches in their hands. That'd be pretty good if they could have palm trees in their hand. Uh, but palm palm limbs in their hand, palm branches in their hands, and they're waving those. Again, that is a sign of victory and a sign of peace. Uh, the, those that's what those palms represented there. But it's very interesting as we're going to go back to the Old Testament now. How the Lord chose to bring this about. Now. He, he gives us some, some warnings or some heads up, if you would, about things to look for. He had promised all the way back in Genesis that he was going to send someone to crush the head of Satan and it was going to bruise the heel of the one who was crushing him. That's Genesis 3.15. But he had, he had promised that there was going to be one who come. And throughout the Old Testament, there is a promise of Messiah. And, and then within the, in the uh, patriarchs, there is a longing and a yearning and a looking for the Messiah to come. Uh, they were looking for that. 
And so God in His Word gives us some evidence of who the Messiah was going to be. And, uh, and, and first of all, we're going to look at how the Messiah was supposed to come onto the scene. How the Messiah was supposed to come onto the scene. Now remember um, Abraham. Remember, I'm not going to take the time to go back and read all of these. You go back and study these. But Abraham, when God made a covenant with Abraham, he said to Abraham some things. He said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And he makes another statement. He says, and, and through you all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And uh, that is a very important Phrase Through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. So there was something that was going to come from Abraham, from the line of Abraham, that was going to bless the whole world or meet a need for the whole world. And so when we go back and look at that, we can see, all right, so the first thing that we can see as far as the Messiah, this is, I think, a promise of the Messiah. He was going to do something for the whole world. And so when we look at Abraham, we can understand when we're looking for the Messiah, where are we going to look? First of all, we're going to look from the line of Abraham. All right, we're going to look from his lineage because that's where God made his covenant and where God made his promise. All right, and then we go through, and, and, and Abraham had two sons. He had Ishmael and he had Isaac. And God had told, went and told Abraham that, that God was going to use the child of promise, that is Isaac, uh, so that and, and that through that seed was going to be the covenant established, and so we see that. So we have Abraham, Isaac. Then Isaac has Jacob and Esau, and then and then we see later on that, that God has chosen Jacob, uh, whose whose name would later be ch changed to Israel. And through Jacob, through Israel, is where we get the twelve tribes of Israel. All right, and we have studied many of those in Genesis forty nine. Now, I want us to go back into Genesis 49 now. When we were talking about this, when we, I didn't get into the prophecy very much in Genesis 49. Uh, but we're going to get into some of this uh, this morning. Genesis 49, look at verse number 8. This is, um, again, we, we've gone from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and now we're in the 12 tribes of Israel. Genesis 49 is Jacob or Israel speaking to the 12 sons and, uh, and he's speaking to them and he's giving them basically their character or what's going to befall them in future days. So let's look at, at verse number 12. No? Eight. Uh, excuse me, 8. Yes, eight, 8 through 12. Excuse me. Verse 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Now that's very interesting. All the rest of the kids in the family are going to bow down to Judah. Now it's not necessarily Judah in particular, but his lineage, all right? So let's look down a little further. Verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now verse 10, this is interesting here. It says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now look, a scepter is something that a king would carry. It is an object or is it, it is something that a king would carry. It, it represents his power and his position. And so remember, so where, where is the scepter going to come from? It's going to come from the line of Judah. So there's going to be a kingly line that's going to come from Judah. All right? The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Now, very interesting that now we see through Judah there's going to be a kingly line. And then also we see until Shiloh come. Now, Shiloh is not a place. It is a person. And, and you hear, you've heard the term that Jewish people use. It's called Shiloh. This is peace or peace with you. Shiloh is not peace with you. Shiloh is the prince of peace. It is prince. All right? It is Shiloh. And, and this is referring again to the Messiah, another name for the Messiah. Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of people be. Now listen, listen to this in verse number 11. So uh, we see, first of all, that it's going to come from the line of Abraham. The Messiah is going to come through the line of Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob. And now we also see through Judah is where the king and the Messiah is going to come from. And then it makes an interesting uh, thing here, an interesting tie here. Look at verse 11. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ashes cold unto the choicest vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. 
Now, I want you to remember, we're going to look at this before, uh, before this message is over. But if you go all the way back to the book of Revelation, we'll see it again. But you remember, it mentions the Lord Jesus Christ coming not on a colt, but on a, on a horse. And it says that his vesture is dipped in blood. Remember that? And it makes it's making reference to some of these things here. But it's very interesting that a donkey here, or an ass's colt, is mentioned here in verse number 11. Verse number 12. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. And, uh, and we'll stop there. That, that's dealing with Judah. So, all right, so where is the Messiah? How are we going to know how, who is going to be the Messiah? He's going to come from the line of Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, and now through Judah. All right, so now through that kingly line of Judah. Now let's go to 2 Samuel. Chapter 7. Now, you can go and read this whole chapter. I'm going to give you a couple verses. This is when God, uh, David wants to build a house for the Lord. David looks at his house and says, hey, I'm living in a great house, but then the Lord's house is still a tabernacle. It's still dwelling in tents. And uh, he, he had a desire to build the temple. And, uh, and so he, he expressed that desire. Um, but then the prophet came, comes back and tells him that he's not going to be the one to build the temple, that his son is going to be the one to build the temple. But God makes David a promise. And now let's look in verse number 16 of chapter 7. And, he's, and this is God speaking um, to David. And it says, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever according to all these words and according to all these visions. So did Nathan speak unto David. Now again, Nathan is speaking on behalf of God to David. So what is the implication here? The implication here is the throne of David is going to be an everlasting kingdom, an everlasting throne. There, it, it's, going to, it's going to last forever. Now let me ask you something. Was David going to last forever? No, I think we all know that David was not going to be going to last forever. But his throne and, he, and the establishment of his throne and his kingdom was going to last forever. Now, when we look at that, what is the first thing that pops into your mind? When we look at Daniel and we look at Revelation and we look at other places, the kingdom that's going to be established forever, who's going to be the ruler of that kingdom? It's going to be Jesus. And so when he and, and God is giving David a covenant here that, that his kingdom and his throne is going to be forever. All right, so we have how, how is the Messiah going to come? He's going to come through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah, and now through David. All right, one other interesting fact, we're going to go and look at Zechariah, and I have used this one before, but we're going to look at it again for the sake of this study. Zechariah chapter 9, and this is a prophecy directly related to the Messiah. So if we're looking at some, for someone who comes through that lineage, all through that lineage, you know, it's very important that when you go through the book of Matthew, for instance, uh, in the first chapter of the book of Matthew, there's genealogies that are recorded there. And so these genealogies are not just there so that you know, uh, you know, whose kid was whose. This, this genealogy in Matthew is to record and to establish that Joseph and Mary were from the line of David, and that Jesus, through humanly speaking, came through that same line. So the line of Judah, the line of David, the, who, who comes from there? Jesus Christ, humanly speaking, comes from that. We know that Joseph was not his real father. We know that Mary was his real mother, and the Holy Spirit was the real father. But he establishes that lineage. He establishes that lineage so that we know exactly who Jesus was, how he was going to be here. And then in Zechariah 9, verse 9, it talks again about the Messiah. And it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Now again, he's speaking directly to Jerusalem. Now look, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. And so here again it is, is another prophecy. So we see the line that he's going to, to come from. This is how he's supposed to get here. And then we see also uh, how he's supposed to enter Jerusalem at that time. And he's supposed to be riding on a donkey. So when we go back to John chapter 12, this is not some insignificant event. 
This is some event that God has, has outlined from, from history gone by that He's going to come from a certain line through certain men all the way down and then He's going to come into Jerusalem in Zechariah 9.9, prophesied that He's going to be riding on a donkey and then we read the fulfillment of that in the book of John where we've already read it. So this is how the Lord Jesus was going to come. This is how the Messiah was going to be presented. And, he, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled this in every way. But not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. Even until the consummation and, the, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, there is a whole lot of wording in there. I'm going to try to break this down just a little bit, briefly, all right? Weeks, when it says 70 weeks here, 70 weeks are determined. Weeks here are sevens. That's really what that means. Seventy sevens, all right? And this is not referring to actually weeks of the days of the week or anything like that. This is referring to years. Seventy weeks, seventy sevens, all right? Seventy-seven years. That's what that means. So what is 70 times 7? What is that? It's 490 years. Now, this 490-year period is broken up into three categories. If you go through and look at this, it says, uh, let, me, let me see here. Verse number 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to, and to build Jerusalem until unto the, Messiah, the prince, until Messiah the prince, shall be seven weeks. Now, if seven weeks is seven sevens, what does that mean? That means how many years is that going to be? It's going to be 49 years. All right, so it gives us a, a sign here. From the time that an edict is given or an order is given to go back and begin to reveal Jerusalem. And by the way, if you go back and read Nehemiah chapter 1, chapter 2, all of this is recorded there. And I think it was the 20th year of the reign. Oh, we can even go back and look at it. We may do that. Let's go back to Nehemiah. Uh, hold your finger here in Daniel. Nehemiah chapter 2. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchre, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant be found favor in thy sight, thou wouldest send me to Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, The queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me, to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come to Judah, and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gate and the palace which pertains to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When, San, with, when Sanballat and Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come men to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. All right, so, so this is very important. When did Nehemiah begin to come back and begin to rebuild the walls and to begin to rebuild the city? And you go back and look at the very first verse of chapter 2. It says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. You see how important sometimes God puts these dates and these months and everything in there? All right, so that is the time. Now remember that. That is the time that, remember back in Daniel what it says, Know therefore in verse 25 and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, 
Until Messiah of the Prince shall be seven weeks. All right, so, so there's 49 years that he's going to come and to rebuild Jerusalem. He's going to have a 49-year period, all right, and then and to rebuild that temple. And so when that happens, was in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes. This is around 445 B.C. There are some historical discrepancies and, and some archaeological arguments about this, but for argument's sake, let's just say it's around that time, 445 B.C., all right? And the other thing is, in verse 25, now look. And unto the prince shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and a wall even in troublous times. So it says three score and two weeks. There's another division here. There's 62 weeks that are divided. Now, what is 62 weeks times seven? That's 434 years. Now, add those together, that's 483 years. Now... All right, so that is 69 weeks, right? The 69 weeks or the 69 sevens, if you would, 69 sevens. And where does that bring us? Well, if you count down, and, and the other thing that I have to throw into this is the Jewish calendar. Our Gregorian calendar has 365 days in a year. All right, remember that. And then also uh, the, the Jewish calendar does not have 365 days in a year. It has 360 days uh, because it's based on the lunar cycles. And so 360 days, if you add all of that up, if you add all of that up and put all of that into account, guess when this is? All right, remember it's 483 years, and this is about the year 445. So do, do the math there. What, what do you come up with? So what year does that bring us to? This brings us to exactly when the Messiah was going to come into on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And so um, so you add all of that up. Alright, go back and study that and read that. We don't have time to go through all of that today. Alright, so and then that leaves us one week. Alright, so there's 70 weeks, but that leaves us one week. And then the last week it begins to talk about the tribulation period. How long does the tribulation period last? When does when does the offering cease? Look again. The abomination let's see. Verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. In the midst of that one week, it is divided. That week, that, that seven-year period is divided. Now, if you go to Revelation and see the tribulation period, you have three and a half years of tribulation, three and a half years of great tribulation. That is that one week. And so now there is a gap between the... 69 weeks and the 70th week. There's a gap there. And then when you go into the New Testament, you'll see words like this. You'll see uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, he's speaking about Christ in the church. He says, I show you a great mystery. And so in the Old Testament versus the New Testament, this was a mystery. This was not foreseen. The church age was not foreseen. And so uh, when, when they're talking about go to look, the word mystery is mentioned many times in the New Testament referring to this age that we live because it was not something that was on at least that God revealed in the Old Testament in our time for us to know. But there is a separation there. Alright, so all right, so you had the 49 years that they were going to be rebuilding Jerusalem. The walls, the streets, all of that. And then you have 483 years. Now, this take, that 49 years takes us up to the end of the book of Malachi. That's the end of the New Testament. Uh, excuse me, end of the Old Testament. And so, how, how, what, what kind of time frame was God silent in between the Testaments? There was 400 years. All right, so, so you add that up and, and, and do the 360 days of the year in the Jewish calendar, and that puts us again right there. And then we have the church age. When, when Jesus Christ would walk into Jerusalem, he would bleed and die on Calvary. This week that we're celebrating this week, he would bleed and die on Calvary. And, uh, and then the church age would begin, and then that last seven, that 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 last seven years, that one, that last week, that last seven years is during the tribulation period, and the period that we're living in right now is the mystery that the New Testament refers to. All right, does all that make sense? Are you with me? Go back and study all that. That gets really deep. All right. <clears throat> now, another thing that I want to I want to share with you in Exodus. Chapter 12. Verse number 1. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. God, God makes his timetable here. The beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for the house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to him his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year you shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat it. Isn't it very interesting that God just didn't say, all right, we're going to have a Passover time. Just do this. He gives a specific month, a specific day, a specific day when the lamb was to be chosen, a specific day when the lamb was to be sacrificed. And now I want us to go back to the New Testament here for just a bit. And I want us to go, now remember, it is the high priest who, is, who has the responsibility of going in once a year into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood sacrifice. I hope you remember these stories. It was his, it was his, uh, it was his responsibility. He would go and select the lamb that was to be sacrificed. He was supposed to, they, were, they were to investigate it. They were supposed to watch it. They were to inspect it. Remember what the Bible says all the way back in it? Without blemish, without spot. It was supposed to have any bruise. It was supposed to be perfect in every way. And it was to be chosen to be uh, the lamb uh, to be sacrificed. Now, back in John 18, I want to go over here. Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the high priest at the time when Jesus was riding in on the donkey. All right? Was riding in the triumphal entry. He was the high priest during this time. And so he is the high priest. So he is the one who was responsible for the choosing of the lamb and for the sacrificing of the lamb. I want you to remember that. All right? And so uh, we go to John chapter 18, verse number 14. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but it says, Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews. Now listen to what he says. That it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So what, what is Caiaphas doing here? What is, what, what is the high priest doing here? He is saying there is one person who is going to die for the people. Now if you go back, and I think it was in, in Daniel, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, it was in Genesis. Where it says he's not going to be dying for himself. He's not dying for himself. He's not dying for himself. He's dying for someone else. That, that was a prophecy that was given. And then we're looking here that the high priest, on the day, the, the day, now remember, there he's marching into Jerusalem. He's riding on that donkey. And it says, oh, the whole world is going after them. And it says, it is expedient that one man die for the people. And let me just say to you, it is expedient that one man die for the people. And so there's a lot of things that Caiaphas got wrong, but that was one thing that he got right. And I don't even think he knew what he was saying when he said it. And so how was the Messiah to come? He was to come through that certain line, through the line of David. He was to come riding upon a donkey. When was he to come? If you look at Daniel 70 weeks, he was to come exactly on that day uh, that, that, was, that was ordained on this Palm Sunday. If you look, look again on Nisan the 10th, believe it or not, on the Palm Sunday in the day that we're looking here, the day that he rode in into Jerusalem, the day that, that Caiaphas was choosing the, the, the sacrifice was the day that he that that, that, um, that that the lamb was to be chosen. That was the day the lamb was to be chosen, and four days later he was to be sacrificed. And the whole time these people are gathered around, and they're saying, Hosanna. Do you know what Hosanna means? It means save us. That's what that means. Now in their mind, they were under the bondage of Rome. And they wanted deliverance from Rome. But this was not God's idea. God's idea was not to deliver them from Rome. God's idea was to deliver them from death. And from hell. And from sin. That was his. So we understand how he was to come. We understand when he was to come. And now we're going to look at why he was to come. Now, 
Why did Jesus come in like this? Again, it was to fulfill prophecy and to point us at all these different fulfillments of prophecy. And I only gave you just a few. And uh, But what, what, as he was coming in, they were crying, Hosanna. What was the one thing he wanted us to recognize? Again, all eyes, all eyes around Jerusalem was upon him. Everybody was crying out, Hosanna, except the religious leaders. Oh, they were, they were, he was very popular at that particular time. They were praising him. They were exalting him. But God wanted him them to recognize the Messiah as the Lamb. They wanted to recognize the Lamb. Oh, he was prominent. He was popular. And just a few days later, what are they going to be? The same ones who were crying Hosanna, what are they going to be saying? They're going to be saying crucified. And the very pictures that God gives us in the Old Testament, is Jesus Christ fulfilling all of those pictures? And that's all that he was trying to get them to see. All that he was trying to get them to see was God's timetable, God's purpose, and God's plan. Not just for Israel, but for the whole world. And that this is the Messiah. This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They, God wanted them to recognize the Lamb, but he also wanted them to recognize the King. Now, as they were, as we read in, in John, they cried, Hosanna to the King. Glory to God in the highest. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know, all that. And so the king is mentioned there. Now, and they have palms in their hands. Now, look, they missed it. You know, they ended up rejecting him. They missed it. But I want you to know there's coming a time when there's going to be something similar. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 7. Verse number 9. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now remember, I, I believe it was uh, Daniel where it says that people are going to be gathered to him. Remember that? And then it says here that... That uh, which no man could number of all nations, kindred, people, tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Now remember what Hosanna means? It means save us. Now look at verse number 10. He cried with a loud voice, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And the angels stood round about the throne and about the elder, the four beasts, and the fell before the throne in their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto the, our God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> and I, I'll, I'll stop there. But I also want to go to Revelation 19. Now remember the first time he comes in on a donkey, right? The donkey is, is a symbol of peace. He's coming in peaceful. Now he was rejected. They did not recognize him as the lamb. And then later on they, they refused to recognize him as king. But in Revelation chapter 19 verse number 11. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. Now, what was he riding before? What is he riding this time? And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Remember what we read in Genesis? And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him, Upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth forth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, the Jewish people did not recognize Jesus at the time of the triumphal entry, the triumphal entrance. They didn't recognize him as king for very long. They tried to make him king, but of course that was, that was quickly put away and they ended up rejecting him. They did not recognize him as the lamb that would take away the sin of the world. They did not recognize that. <clears throat> and, you know, I think at the moment that we live, 
that we have this virus going around, and there are eyes that are looking and searching for answers. I think people are reading their Bible, they're praying more than they ever have before. I think believers are praying, and I think even unbelievers are praying out of fear and terror. And, uh, but I, I think even during the time that we live, I think He wants us to look to Him. He wants us to see Him, not just as the guy who, who grants what we want, but He wants us to look to Him as the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. He wants us to look to Him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, I have, I have racked my brain and I have read some of this, but there's only been a few times that God has allowed worldwide things to happen. One of them is right now where we're living. One of them was when Jesus died on the cross and he shed his blood for the sins of the whole world. And another time was when the flood came back in Genesis. And so... As God is trying to direct our attention toward Him, what does that mean? This global pandemic that we've experienced, that we're experiencing right now, and eyes are being turned to Him, I want you to think about what God has done. And I'm speaking from a Western culture, and, and it's probably true in other places, but the gods that we had erected, the kings that we had set on the throne of our heart, that we had put us into power, and I don't mean presidents or politicians. I mean money, sporting events, all those type of things. God in one swipe cut the heads off of every one of them. To get our eyes off of the gods that we have erected and to put our eyes upon the king of kings. And I hope and pray that God uses this time for all of us to reevaluate the priorities that we have. You know what? You're not hearing about Caroline and Duke or State. You're not hearing about who won the NASCAR race. You're not hearing about all those things. And I'm just going to be honest. Now, look, I'm not against those things. But I'm kind of glad I'm not hearing about them right now. And I'm hearing more about Jesus. And I want to say to those this morning that have never looked Jesus was popular at the time of the triumphal entry, and later on he was rejected. I want to say to you, there's a lot of people who, who Jesus is popular with, but he's never been personal with you. Look, he was popular with all the people as he walked into Jerusalem. And just a few days later, they cried, crucify him. Now, you can go around, we live in North Carolina, the Bible Belt, the, bu the buckle of the Bible Belt. You can go to people, knock on their door, talk to them in town. Everybody knows about Jesus, don't they? But I'm going to tell you something. Just knowing about him is not enough. We can know all the facts there is to know about the Bible, but until you have personally received Jesus Christ and embraced Him as the Lamb that takes away your sins, not just the sin of the world, you embrace Him that takes on your sin, and you've invited Him into your life and trusted Him by faith, and He has changed your life. I see a lot of people, He's popular, but their life has never been changed. And I want to say to you today that God has, has, has quieted everything for just a little bit. And he's trying to draw our attention just like he did at Palm Sunday. Attention to the Messiah. Attention to the King. Attention to the Lamb. For us to turn our lives and our hearts and our minds toward him. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior personally, not just knowing about the facts, but you've given your life to him and he's come into your life and he's changed your life, I want to say God bless you, wonderful. But if you've never done that, I'm going to tell you today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. But then for us as Christians, those who know Him personally, this is time for us, I think, to evaluate our own lives to see what kind of gods we've erected in our own life and to get back and to recognize Him for who He is supposed to be in our life. The Lamb of God who's taken away our sins and the King of glory, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I hope we all do that today. And we're going to sing a song here in closing. And, uh, and I would encourage you
If you don't know Christ, look, you don't have to be at a church. You don't have to be, talk to a preacher. All you have to do is you have to get along with God because it's a relationship between you and Him. And you cry out for Him, repenting of your sins and asking Him to save you. And the Bible says that He'll do that. He said, He that cometh to me, I will know why it's cast out. And He'll change your life, change your direction, change your eternal destiny. Let's sing together. song to sing, to proclaim, hallelujah, what a Savior. Mm -hmm. 